<clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, so the, uh, the topic that I'll be discussing is uh, the improbability of chance. Um, so uh, the theory of life's origin from molecules to complex beings um, can be accounted for by natural random events, and thus a designer is unnecessary. This is the, uh, the basis of the chemical evolution that um, evolutionists are you know, holding on to. That basically chemical subunits assembled, uh, assembled information rich in polymers uh, at a completely undirected process. That means all information, all information had come into the cell and that these chemical subunits had interacted with one another at a completely undirected, unforced uh, manner, and it created these uh, um, life beings and these, these uh, assemblies of life from the very beginning. And uh, I was just thinking about it when I came up here, that this is something like uh, you know, a person being thrown in a pool and then kicking in every direction and then somehow still expecting to move forward. And that's kind of how you know, what's, being, what's being kind of propagated uh, about the origins of life. I mean, if we consider afterlife, there's, there, are, there are influences that they can explain, such as natural selection and, uh, you know, the need, the drive to um, commit replica replication and pass down genes. But this is something that's not present in the beginning of life when you're just dealing with simple molecular subunits. So this person, Albert uh, Leninger, described it. He said, we now come to a critical moment of evolution in which the first semblance of life appeared through the chance association of a number of abiotically formed macromolecular macro components. Um, and that's basically a description of what they, of what they uh, adhere to. So the chance hypothesis. Uh, science has since evolved to recognize that th there is greater complexity with the magnificence, uh, the magnificence that strains this theory. Um, since then, at the time of Charles Darwin, uh, they were, it was said to explain that life could have evolved gradually, and that basically, through a series of you know simple reactions, that you could you could get something like a, a cell, a, a very basic primitive uh, structure. Um, that at the time that this is what they thought a cell was. This per this person Ernst uh, Haeckel, who was a who was a German um, biologist, who um, brought who made popular Charles Charles Darwin's uh, theory of evolution, described. The, the simple cell, described the cell as a simple homogeneous globule of plasma. Today we recognize that this is far from the case. Today it has been seen, today we see the cell and actually when we've gone into it and, ex, and, and with advances of technology, that's seen more as a highly advanced microprocessor. Uh, it has gene codes with enormous specificity, a sophisticated mode of replication for proofreading the mechanisms of making sure that the fidelity of the, of the DNA is maintained and that the information is passed on accurately from one, uh, one generation to the next. That there's a signal transduction pathway that basically allows the cells to, com to communicate with one another um, and act in unison and, and in sync with one another. And then more recently, the idea of alternative gene splicing, which is that even with the 20,000 genes that we have uh, the enormous uh, gene information that we have, we're seeing now that, uh, that this information is also able, at, once it's transcribed, that there are multiple variations that can be uh, created from, from these individual genes. So it's not 20,000, it's many, many times the 20,000. Uh, so I have this video here that I just wanted to kind of, for those people who aren't in biology, to kind of... Uh, it would be like a good introductory that I found, and it kind of just shows the um, the uh, the pathway in which uh, genes are transcribed in, in the creation of proteins. So here it is. Hold on. Is there a way to get uh, volume?
1957, Francis Crick first proposed that chemicals called bases along the spine of the DNA molecule function as alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a machine code. This animation shows how this digital information directs protein synthesis. First, a large protein complex separates the tightly wound strands of the DNA to prepare it to be copied. During this process of transcription, a protein complex called a polymerase produces a single-stranded copy of the original instructions. Here we see this copy, the messenger RNA molecule, being constructed inside the polymerase as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. Now we see the polymerase in action from the outside as it spits out the messenger RNA transcript. Next, this RNA transcript approaches and passes through a molecular machine called the nuclear pore complex an information recognition device that controls the flow of information in and out of the cell's nucleus. Now we see the genetic assembly instructions on the messenger RNA approaching and arriving at a two-part chemical factory called a ribosome, the site of protein synthesis. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome, the process of translation begins. During translation, a mechanical assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids in accord with the instructions on the transcript. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell by molecules called transfer RNAs, which link specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids. The sequential arrangement of the amino acids determines the type of protein constructed. When the construction of the chain is complete, it is transported to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape required to perform its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is released into the outer cytoplasm to do its job in the cell. I think we can uh, say it's not just the music, it's also, you can see that it's, it's a very complex and uh, it's, it's an amazing process that we see. Um, uh, so, so moving on, uh, framing the science, uh, you know, what are we dealing with? Uh, the hypothesis of the origin of life is a historical science. So that's different from other forms of science in that much of the evidence has disappeared. If there is nothing, if there's nothing to observe, or interpretation cannot, cannot proceed beyond speculation. Nor is it possible to test these unique uh, events that happened in the past. Um, and so these things are highly speculative. It, it's something that you know, we have no grasp of, and we can't ever be certain about these things. But um, scientists have, in their strong adherence to materialism, they'll they'll still believe that the, 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 the things that we have at play right now, the machinery that we have at play, is what was affected, is what was causing the effect back then. And this person, George Walt, also a, a famous scientist, he said, given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. Meaning that, you know, not, not to look at the details, we're going to just look at it from a this, that this is how it happened, despite how amazing that these things are. And that's one of the things that I'm going to try and uh, address here. Um, so the historical science is different from 
non-historical sciences, and that it's the science of past causes. Um, it's to determine ancient conditions, to explain the present manifested events by referencing past causal events, and also to do the opposite, to infer the reconstruction of past events, uh, past causes uh, based on present day clues, such as fossils, earth core samples, etc. And that's what, um, that's something called abductive reasoning. It's, um, it's, uh, yeah, this is the, this is the form of science that's, uh, it's much more speculative than, than the other forms of reasoning. The other forms being the in inductive reasoning. Universal laws or principles is established from repeat observations of the same phenomena. So if we want to test, you know, and understand the characteristics of gravity, we, we take two items, one, one much more heavier than the other, and we drop them at the same time, and we see what happens, and we further learn more about what, um, by observing these events over and over again, what, what exactly uh, characterizes the laws such as gravity. Deductive reasoning, in which a particular fact is deduced by applying a general law to another per, uh, particular fact or case. Um, so this is basically using experiments to come to these conclusions. Abductive reasoning infers unseen facts, events, or causes in the past from clues or facts in the present. To say otherwise, to say, to say otherwise abductive reasoning yields plausible but not certain conclusions. Um, that means there is a cap in how much we can really infer from this because we don't have um, all of our senses and all of the, all of the present, we don't have that, that event back then to be, be able to infer and make uh, and evidence to be basically to make these uh, further scientific studies. So consider the following premise, um, the, this logic that if it rains, the streets are wet and if the streets are wet, therefore it rained. Can anyone see a, a, a problem with this statement? Just because it rained doesn't mean necessarily that, or just because it, uh, the streets were, were wet doesn't mean necessarily that it rained. So this is kind of, in, uh, this is kind of what um, illustrates like what has happened in the past and, and the, the, the troubles that you can get into by inferring what has happened in the past. So can chance be sufficiently, uh, can chance be a, a, a sufficient explanation? What does it mean to say that something happened by chance? Um, so consider these two examples. One, a ball falls, uh, sorry, a, a bridge experiences normally strong winds and it falls. And the condition, and, and, and from these conditions, the engineers, they, they investigate and they look at what had happened and they find that, and they come back with a conclusion that this, and they give the explanation for why it fell by chance. Now consider this other option. A person walked into a casino and was able to guess the correct number on a roulette wheel where the odds of winning are 1 in 38 and that person, when he wins, he, it's, it's explained equally much as, as by chance. So we have, one we have one situation where a bridge falls by chance and another situation in which a person wins on a roulette wheel by chance. Which of these explanations to us seem more satisfactory with, with, and more informative uh, by saying something happened by chance. Everyone say that the roulette wheel, because, and the reason for that is because we, with the roulette wheel, everything is kind of defined. We know the machinery of, of the wheel. We know that each slot has its own uh, equally spaced uh, areas. And everything is pretty much accounted for. But when it comes to a bridge, this is open to the environment. It's open to outside influences. And we don't have all these, all these things um, uh, explained or understood, and they're not a known process. So therefore, we, we don't know what happened. It's not, it's not, it cannot be easily dismissed that something happened by chance. The engineer would, anyone, any authority that was looking at the situation would say that, you know, this, this is not a good explanation, that there's some other cause behind it. So how do scientists test, test the chance hypothesis? Um, there's a difference between improbable and extremely improbable events. This person, Ronald Fisher, he's a statistician. He pioneered this kind of field. And he made these observations. He said that some phenomena could be reasonably explained by or at least attributed to random processes or chance events. But on the other hand, statisticians catch or identify events that resulted from factors other, other than chance by specifying a rejection region. So 
these things, uh, these, when, when there, should be a re there should be a normal uh, probability uh, um, spectrum of events that we see that the results come and they follow a certain probability. But when things are constantly at the very edge of probability and, and uh, just extreme uh, chance that these things are happening and occurring over and over and over again, there's reason and cause to um, assume that there's something else at play. Uh, if a person wins on a roulette wheel three times in a row, then we're going to consider that this person is doing something or that the wheel, there's a problem with the wheel, and uh, we would make that assumption that, that there is a reason to say that this person is, is, is either cheating or, or there's some other cause for, for why this person is winning. We, w we wouldn't just automatically accept that something happened by chance. So wh why are we doing this with why are we doing this with evolutionary theory? Why is this something that we're, we're accepting? So, uh, you can say, but extremely improbable events happen all the time. And you'd be right. If I ask you to flip a coin, and if you're bored enough to do this, if you, ask, if you actually flipped a coin a hundred times in a row, you would, whatever, and you recorded the results, whatever that you experienced would have been something that's extremely improbable that this sequence, whatever it is, is extremely improbable. Same thing with the roulette wheel. Uh, the, the chances of getting whatever sequence you get is, uh, is uh, for flipping a quarter would be 10 to the 30th power, which is just an extraordinarily no uh, large number, and that's the chance of it happening again. So what is the difference between this type of chance, this type of event where um, a person is, there is an agenda behind it, or a pattern, and one of these basically random events where it's basically the same, the same uh, probability of happening. It, but we all know intuitively that if, if a person gets uh, heads in a row a hundred times, they know that, we know that there's something else at play. So this person, uh, his name is uh, William Dembski, uh, he's a mathematician. Uh, he studied uh, this and made his own insights about what this was, and he said that First of all, to, to, to assume, to say that there's something that happened, to dismiss the chance hypothesis, you have to have two things. One, it has to be extremely improbable, an extremely improbable event. Something that does not match um, the regular occurrences. And number two, there has to be some recognizable pattern that's outside the influence of the system. So, we recognize if, if, it were, if a person was spinning the roulette wheel and was getting even odd, even odd, or uh, you know, I don't know, it was progressing by a certain uh, uh, unit or, mo or multiple, we would say, we would recognize the pattern and say that there's something there. Um, and, but it, it's not just limited to strict patterns, it's also like, if there's an agenda at play, if, if a person is winning or if there's some other uh, force or, or agenda at work, that is another recognizable pattern. And these two things are caused to, um, these two things were caused to reject the chance hypothesis, and that's known as Dembski's criteria. So can specified information for the first instances of life have arisen by chance alone? According to the chance hypothesis, from the origin of biological information, molecular building blocks of DNA, RNA, protein interacted in a prebiotic environment. It could be a soup or an ocean or whatever it is that they say. Uh, these, molecule, these molecular subunits would attach to one another to form chain-like molecules. And, but to form just chain-like mo molecules is not enough. They, it's not just any arrangement that will do to form something that's functional and meaningful. The overwhelming majority of arrangements of bases and amino acids perform no biological function at all. And that's something that needs to be understood that just because things, even if they had the affinity to come together, would not have formed something, it's not enough to explain that as, as something meaningful. But even then, those things have their own, their own difficulties. The sequence in which monomers are joined, the individual units are joined together to make polymers, is, a vi is vital to the function of polymers like DNA and protein. They can't function without them. No mechanism by science and, and by today's standards have proposed for joining monomers in a meaningful sequence that's directed. Thus, abiotically synthesized organic polymers are assumed to have been randomly sequenced. Once again, the randomness. Not only that, building 
a living cell not only requires specified, specified information, it requires vast amounts of it. It's not just enough to have a single molecule of, of a sequence that's important. You need to have vast, vast amounts of information that can have an ecosystem of a cell that, and a system that um, allows life and supports life. So this first thinking about this chance hypothesis was first, I mean, the, this was kind of brewing within the scientific community. And the first public inkling of concern about the chance hypothesis surfaced in Philadelphia in 1966 at a famous conference of, uh, ma of mathematicians and biologists. Uh, the conference was entitled Math Mathematical Challenges to Neo-Darwinism. Neo it was held at the Windstar Institute and chaired by Peter Mid Middauer, uh, who, was also, who was a Nobel laureate in, from England. The conference was called to discuss the growing doubts of many mathematicians, physicians, uh, physicists and engineers about the ability of random mutations to gen generate the information needed to produce new life forms. Well, according to some of these MIT professors, the neo-Darwinism, the neo-Darwin uh, mechanism faces what is called the combinatorial problem. So that means once things, once these individual units start to come together, there's more and more likelihood of problems. So what this, what, let's, let's uh, illustrate this more. Uh, the combinatorial, uh, combinatorial referring to the number of ways in which a set object can ar be arranged or combined. So consider the, the number of possibilities of arranging in a correct sequence. So if we're looking for a specific sequence and we have two letters, A and B, uh, and we're just trying to se sequence something of only two letters long, but we want something very specific, A, B. We still have, just by things randomly coming in contact with, with one another, you'll have four possibilities, A, 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 B, B, A, B, B. But the problem with, with this is that once, let's say we want to add something else on top of that, the problem is, is that we see when you, when you want to add a third link to the chain, that there's now eight possibilities. So it's not that, so with each step, you're, you're, you're getting more and more difficulty. It's doubling every time, not just more, it's not just increasing, it's doubling every time. With proteins, it's even, a it's even a more of an extreme uh, scenario. With proteins, a sequence length of two amino acids means that you have to get, just getting the right two amino acids together is 20 to the 20th power, or to the second power, which means you have to look for one in 400 possibilities. And if you add a third one, it's, it's now 8, 000, one in 8,000 possibilities. So the longer the chain, the greater the improbability. Um, so, this is, this is basically an observation made by Alexander uh, Cairns uh, Smith, a, bi a biochemist in 1971. He said, blind chance is, a very, is very limited. Low levels of cooperation can produce exceedingly easily the equivalent of letters and small words, but it becomes very incompetent as the amount of organization and information increases. So this, this is basically, uh, to illustrate the point, monkeys on a typewriter. Um, it's commonly said that if you give um, enough time, or you know, if you have an infinite, an infinite amount of time, that monkeys will be able to create the whole works of Shakespeare. It's, and imagine like, you know, just missing that comma at the end or whatever, and, and then the whole thing is, is destroyed. That, that's basically what they're trying to say, is that infinity, that if you have this thing, and we all know that this doesn't make much sense, that, that it's possible that, uh, a whole works of Shakespeare can be made by just someone pounding on a, on, a, on a keyboard. But that's what is basically being propagated by science. And the other thing to notice is that infinite is not, when, when physicists deal with infinity, they're dealing with actual numbers, but it's very, very large numbers. They're not, they're not it's not actual infinity. So yes, like hypothetically or, or theoretically that this is, this could be possible, but there's nothing in this universe that dictates what infinity, there, there is no example of infinity in this universe. The number of particles in the universe, 10 to the, 10 to the 80, if you subdivide each of the, the atoms, uh, in, the individual particles, that's still a number that physicists deal with and they calculate and they, and they you know, and, and they work with. And, and if, it, if, it, if there's more, if it's more or less, it's, it's consequential. So, consider the difficulties of assembling one functional protein. Um, uh, a specific sequence for the amino acids. There exists about 20 different varieties, so not just A and B, but A through T. Um, and therefore, the probability would be 10 to the X, whatever X is, the number of sequences. So considering just a relatively short 
amino acid, which is 150 base, uh, 150 uh, amino acid residues. Um, just being able to sequence them would be 10 to 20 to the 150th power, which is an astronomical number that you know, we can't even comprehend. But um, other scientists have looked at this and say, that, well, you know, that's not necessarily true. You know, well, not every unit of every amino acid is necessary for you know, producing a functional protein. And, and, and that's, that's, that's true. Um, so there are mitigating factors. An evolutionary biologist asked the question, what if functional genes are more common than, than mathematicians are supposing? How rare or common are the functional sequences of amino acids in, in a chain of any given length? So this was looked at by this, by this doctor, his name is uh, Douglas Axe from the Discovery Institute. Um, and through his mutagenesis uh, experiments, he said, he found that, uh, and he studied that the stability of protein folds within amino acid sequences in regard to their ability to maintain biological function. And this was, this was published in, in the Journal of Molecular Biochemistry uh, up till 2004. From, from them, he developed a rigorous method of estimating the allowable variability in order to eliminate possible estimation errors in that previous number of 10 to the 195th. But even with this number, even with that number, and in considering these variable regions that are tolerant and forgivable, um, where anything can actually be put in place, Axe estimated the probability of sequencing a 150 amino acid chain with this tolerance and still being functional would be 10 to the 74th power, which is, uh, sometimes you have to see it out. It's, it's an extremely, extremely small number. And just like I said, uh, if you were to flag an atom in the universe and then have it out there and, uh, and try and find it, it would be easier to find that one molecule than to, than to actually have this, this chance of happening. There's only 10 to the 17th uh, um, seconds in the universe, speculated by scientists. So that's like all another like a dimension that you can kind of, or for comparison. So consider the difficulties of assembling one functional protein, the correct chemical bond. This is another layer of complexity. Amino acids must form the correct bond. It's not just enough that they link together randomly with enough energy and enough uh, you know, orientation to connect. They have to, have, they have to have a specific orientation. It has to be the peptide bond, this, this bond right here. Um, and it can't, and a lot of times that these amino acids, if you leave them alone in a test tube, this amino group will interact with this R group right over here. So then, like, uh, and that's not a functional protein. So it has to form the correct amino bond and uh, the peptide bond. And this, again, if you're looking at 150 uh, amino acid sequence, we're looking at 1 half times 1 half times 1 half for up to 150. And that adds an additional complexity of 10 to the 45th power. Um, so this is also another thing looked at by the Winstar Institute because they wanted to get an accurate number. Not every amino acid, even if it's in the correct orientation and in the correct sequence, can still be useful for, for the function of a protein. It turns out in biological systems that there are uh, D amino acids and L amino acids. And these are enantiomers, they call them, of one another, isomers. And it's all because of this this carbon, this central carbon, that, there's, that you basically have a mirror image of, of itself. And uh, normally in the, bio, in, in the biological system, only one is made. But when you're dealing with a system that's outside of, uh, um, of a living uh, system, both, both of them are produced uh, just equally. So you're going to have to consider if, if uh, in the beginning of life that this is, another, this is another issue where it's a, once again, you're cutting in half all of the possible uh, uh, variables and so uh, uh, acceptable amino acids. And so once again, it's another layer of 10 to the 45th power that we're adding onto this. So this is kind of like a summary of it, 10 to the 74th for the sequence specificity, uh, 10 to the 45th for a, a correct chemical bond formation, and 10 to the 45th for the correct L amino acid, which is the only uh, type of um, the, of the specific amino acid that's useful. So this ends up being 10 to the 64th power. Once again, an extremely large number that, you know, it's, it's hard, to, hard to grasp. 
So, I mean, it's easy kind of to, to, to step out back because it's kind of hard to absorb these numbers and say, well, with enough time, anything is possible. So going back to our example of illustrating the, this point that of, of the roulette wheel, so if a per, and there is, there is something to this point, that if we were to have a person that, that uh, went into a, um, a casino again and, and spun the roulette wheel and was able to get a 1 in 38 chance of being right, what would be the chance of them getting that same uh, winning number correct three times in a row? So it turns out 38 times 38 times 38 equals one chance in 54,000. So, um, but what if a person was, what if, so that, that is extremely uh, improbable by itself, but what if um, a person was at a, at a roulette or was you know, in the casino for 12 hours a day, a week, just like that, just like that crazy guy uh, in, in Vegas that did all those terrible things. He, it's possible that if you have those, if you have those situ, if you have this situation where you're there long enough and you have enough uh, chances, that these things can, these things can actually uh, become probable. But, but with, so would this increase the probability by chance getting the right number three times in a row? The answer would be yes. Um, so this demonstrates probabilistic resources, the number of chances the num that we have to do these things. So this is a number that we have to consider. With all those molecules in the universe and, or, you know, that are kind of moving around in an in, in a ocean or whatever, all these little particles rubbing or, or coming in contact with one another, it's something that scientists argue that, that this is a, this is, it's possible that something can happen. So Bill Dembski once again looked into this and said, uh, he was set out to, to determine this and quantify this definitive number, or more definitively. So uh, to do this, he set out to calculate the maximum number of opportunities that each, that any particular event would happen to take place in the whole universe. So any event taking place. So he knew the number of particles in the universe, 10 to the 80, uh, in the observable universe. So uh, there's just particles dealing, that we're dealing with. Uh, the number of physical transitions that can occur. Each molecule or electron has, when it, when it gets past, when energy gets passed through, it's uh, b limited by the speed of light. It's known by Planck's constant. Can have like a certain amount of, of interactions and, uh, that can take place. There's a limit to them, and that's 10 to the 43rd power. Um, and, and that's per second. So we, we take that number and we calculate it by, num then by the total number of seconds um, in the universe, which is being estimated like uh, 13 billion years. Uh, the number of seconds is that is, in that is 10 to the 17th power. So they add them all up and you have a definitive number, and that's 10 to the 140th power. Given our calculation from earlier, that example of the 150 amino acid sequence, which is a very short sequence um, of, for a functional protein, it's still insufficient for, for producing a, uh, with all those probable, res with all that probable resources. If you, if you subtract the two, you're still left with 10 to the 24th, and that's still a trillion trillion. So, and that's just for a 50-50% chance. So the odds are not good. Okay, beyond, so now this, this kind of sets it beyond the reach. There are additional layers of complexity to account for uh, the abiotic environment. So in, in biological function, it's not just enough to have a normal sequence to have, or have a correct sequence in the correct order with the correct bonds. Cells take those DNA or those uh, protein strands, and they manipulate them, and proteins bind, and and from the binding they create other other. They have to ensure that the, the protein actually forms in a in a shape that's uh, that's functional. So that's an additional layer that like that needs to be accounted for. That just without these proteins, which didn't exist in the pre prebiotic environment, that those things had to have somehow come in contact with with one another to make sure that these these proteins uh, can assemble and shape itself in the right form. And then, in addition to that, there are multiple, a, a, a protein may not be functional with just one strand. It, it may need, need four. Hemoglobin is one example, insulin is another. So building a cell out of chance. It requires vast amounts of information. The probability of this amount of specified info arising by chance is vanishingly small. It's hard to quantify because biologists didn't know exactly how much information was necessary to build and maintain the simplest living cell. Um, 
So they actually like, wanted to work their way back, start from the other end. And that's when they looked, they tried to find the, the very basic, simplest cell. And they, and they found this one cell, a very small uh, bacteria called mycoplasma. It's a tiny uh, bacterium that lives within human cells. And uh, they found out that it has 482 proteins, and it needs, for a necessary function, 562,000 bases of DNA to assemble those proteins. And they took, even they took that, and they tried to reduce it down even more. So they started knocking, that, knocking out each, and taking away each, each individual protein, and seeing what, what can still support life. So they brought it down to 250 genes uh, to 400 genes. That would be very, the, the minimal amount needed for survival. Um, it would also require a host of pre-existing proteins. So even then, even if you have the right genes, you're still in, you're, you're still in the, uh, the, the trouble of needing the, uh, the machinery, the existing mach machinery to, uh, to um, be in place so that that protein can interact with And also an, an energy supply. So this is um, Focusing more on the, the topic of probabilistic resources, uh, this is an experiment called the Miller-Urey Miller experiment. This was um, a, a big game changer to the, to the field of evolution. And it's basically what established evolution as in text, textbook orthodoxy, in that uh, they found out that they, here we have this, this machine that was put together, or this uh, lab uh, equipment that was put together, and they put, these gases in a in a um, in a holding chamber, and they and they basically uh, ran a ran a current. They ran a current through it, and they had and then after a few days, they collected uh, a substance that developed at the bottom of this U-shaped uh, um, uh, tube. And they basically looked at this brown substance, and what they found inside of it was proteins, amino acids, nu uh, nucleic acids, we, uh, we, the individual subunits of DNA, ribose, uh, purines, and pyrimidines, uh, polysaccharides, the sugars, uh, fats, uh, and a whole array of organic molecules. And so they said, wow, look, look what we have here. This is like, this is the early Earth. We basically try to assimilate the early Earth atmosphere by putting water, amino um, ammonia, hydrogen, and, and methane in, into this chamber, which is what they presumed was in the early atmosphere. And they ran an electrical current through it, and, and these are the molecules that, they, that spontaneously formed. So that's like, a, that, here, wow, we have something that's really like a, a, something to work with here. Um, but it turns out that this didn't prove chemical evolution, that when looking at it, and, and with new information that has come out since then, that they presuppose that, that methane, hydrogen, gas, uh, ammonia, and uh, water vapor was present in the early atmosphere, and there was no oxygen. Ideal, ideal, uh, an ideal environment for, for uh, um, creating these things. And if you have oxygen in, in a, they assume that they didn't put oxygen in it because they assumed that, like, uh, that the early Earth atmosphere didn't have it, and it would be a big problem if it was in there because oxygen is, is, a, is a menace to um, reactions. It reacts with anything and kind of destroys the, the process. So, so the, but this was a problem because these gases that they, that they put in is a very, fav very favorable gases. They're reducing gases, which means that like you run any kind of current through them it will be an exothermic reaction and spontaneously form these things. So it's like a, it's a very favorable environment. What turns out from the geochemical evidence is that they found out that the gases that were in play were mostly neutral gases, and that there were significant amounts of free oxygen that were basically from the separation of water vapor that they found that that was a, no, a, a measurable amount that was interacting with the early Earth atmosphere. So whatever would happen if they ran, if, they, if, if, if these... Um, gases that came in contact with energy uh, would end up having produced very trace amounts of, of uh, this organic uh, products that they were using for building blocks. So the products were not enriched with, chemical, with chemicals that make up or organisms. This was a particular problem with the stereoisomers. Experiments were often, uh, re uh, often remove, would often remove um, non-biological relevant compounds. So 
a lot of times when, when this experience went, uh, took place, they would remove the toxic compounds from, from that had developed that would end up degrading the, 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 the productive compounds. So this is kind of like what they, what they see is like the early Earth atmosphere or what they kind of envision. Lots of energy, lots of things coming in contact with one another. And uh, or the origin of information-rich biological molecules assume the existence of a favorable prebiotic soup. This is what they call the primordial soup that they say life came out of. Um, not surprisingly, the body of evidence shows that there, there's reasons to doubt this inference of the prebiotic soup. Two, per, two uh, scientists, geochemists, uh, James Brooks and Gordon Shaw, that they're leading in their field, argued that if an ocean rich in amino acids and nucleic acids had existed, it would have left large deposits of nitrogen-rich material. So a lot of these compounds that are used for biology, the amino acids, are, are rich with nitrogen. And so if they're saying that in, they, they're saying that it would make sense that if this was the environment back then, that there would be lots of deposits of this nitrogen-rich material, and there would be lots of nitrogen in there. And there's no evidence of such deposits exist in the, in the Precambrian sediment. The importance of the Precambrian sediment is that right here, this is where it is, um, 500 million years ago, there was a big explosion of life and all sorts of things happened. And we went from stuff that was not even seeable to land animals, plants, dinosaurs, all sorts of things supposedly from, from 500 years ago. So they're looking at this era and they're finding out that if that was the case, we should be able to look back and see that this era where there was, which was very productive in, in the time of evolution, that there should be um, evidence of nitrogen. And what they found is the, nitro the, the nitrogenous content of the pre-Cambrian organic material was less than 0.015%. So the primordial soup that everyone talks about, it's reasonable to, to conclude that there never really was any substantial primitive soup in the beginning of, of, uh, of the early Earth. So what does this mean? Without nitrogen-rich prebiotic environment, whatever specificity the chance hypothesis might have had once is now lost. Further, many destructive chemical processes would have necessarily been at work at the same time, producing non-biological substances and biological building blocks. OK, so this is another, um, this is a, a graph of an uh, evolutionary tree. Um, but it, it's, it's morphology of uh, proteins. You can apply proteins or uh, living uh, species, whatever. It's all, it, it doesn't make a difference. That basically, as it expands sideways, you have increased morphology. And with time, you're advancing. You're advancing with evolution. So these proteins are gaining more function as we're going this way. The problem with this is that it basically implies that every point along this, along this chain is a functional protein. And I don't think I have it, but um, these, this person named Douglas Axe, uh, he look, actually looked at this and was looking at the stability of, of um, these protein structures. Because it's not enough to just have functional proteins that you tweak a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and you, get, and you gain more and more function. Not all uh, you know, protein function, the next step in evolution, doesn't all, hasn't shown that it's just simple, gradual tweaks in, in, in the function. You have to have these intermediates to get in to the next step. So basically, you have useless information, useless intermediate proteins are being produced by these living cells, and, and, and it's just carrying along. And you can carry on this, you know, you can only drag the, the garbage for so long before it starts to degrade. You can't have a, a, a non-functional protein being produced uh, time and time again for no reason because the cells need the energy they're not going to waste it on 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 something that it's useless but that's what is required to get to the next step of evolution to get to the next protein to ne to evolve and so there's there's problems here that we that we found out that that because there's no stable function there's no stable intermediates that are functional that we find out that that we're having a hard time understanding how what the next step is how we progress so why intelligent design should be considered a viable option? All, creation ha all creations have a creator. Uh, creation of a new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. This is what Henry Quaisler, who was an application information theory uh, uh, biologist. So 
this is stuff that like is commonly attacked by um, atheists, prominent atheists, Richard Dawkins, um, people like Sam Harris and, and Daniel Dennett. They say that they say that well, if we have uh, it, they, so uh, I should step back a little bit. Uh, it, people who are who people who are who are believe in intelligent design, they often make the they make the the, the argument that if we were to see a watch, you know, out in the wilderness. We, we would assume that there is a watchmaker, that there was something that, that, that there was someone that made that watch. And there are watchmakers, according, as we know today, whenever we see a, a, a little device or something, that there is someone that made that device. And so it's a logical conclusion. Similarly, also, if we were to see, be walking in a desert and we see sand dunes and all of a sudden we, we come across one sand dune and it's got these elaborate sand castles on it, we would assume that someone made that. That it, there was someone else, uh, there was something else at work, and someone else that was intelligent that had put that it, that those would have the the signatures of of those of, of intelligent design. But these atheists, they look at this and they say, "Well, where is the DNA maker? Where where is the people that made? Uh, where where is this intelligent design uh, in hap happening? Where 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 is the proof, the evidence of of a DNA maker?" And if you've read uh, the, the, the book that Abuna Gregory mentioned yesterday was uh, the Stephen Meyer's signature in the cell, goes into this in great detail and it shows that there are indeed evidence of, of intelligent design. Dembski's criteria of the pattern that we had, had, were looking for earlier is met. There's a digital code, there's specified complex complexity, and there's sequence specificity. These are all things that we see as programmers or engineers. These are all signatures of, 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 of creation, of, of, of engineers, of, of, of processes that, that create. So I guess this is, this is the end. Uh, the role of the dice. So it's generally accepted that as tools, as tools as random as that when you roll a dice that you basically have a one in six chance of, of, uh, of producing something, and, that, and that's considered by chance. But closer inspection reveals otherwise. If you had the opportunity to, uh, to roll a dice but know the exact force in which it left your hand, the torque that you provided in the spin on the dice, the coefficient of friction on the, on the table, and the angle in which it, it hit the table, you would be able to predictably find the right answer, uh, you would be able to predict what, what number it would land on. So if we have, if we, because we're limited, we, we perceive these things as chance. But if there is, if there is, uh, if with an omnipotent being, we on the outside, we, don't, we, we can't we explain these things as by chance, but with an, uh, a pers with an entity that's omnipotent and that knows all things and can make these calculations, none of these things would be by chance. It would all be by intention. So, I don't know, I'll leave you with that, I guess. Any questions? I was wondering, because there's also the, I forget the name of the number, but the probability that there's life on another planet. Do you know where they got those numbers from? Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really sure uh, if, what, what, the, what the numbers are exactly. Where, what are you referring to exactly? I, I forget. There's like some... And uh, Abuna Andrews nodding his head. I, maybe you know the number that I'm talking about, but in like, I guess it's astrobiology, I guess. <laughs> but if you have X number of planets, the probability that there's one in that X has life. So, well, because it's related to what, what you're saying, right? Yeah, well, I mean, what I was trying to explain that hopefully going through this, this exercise, you'll see that the, the probability of producing one functional protein is extremely improbable. So 
logically you would assume that you know if the, with this one chance of improbability that there wouldn't be uh, other other issues or, or other situations of life it's it's possible because we have a universe i mean i don't know if it's possible i'm not i'm not even anyone to to comment on that but but we do live in a universe where things are peculiarly peculiarly tuned for life and this is what scientists are coming in contact, coming in uh, um Great, coming to grips with, that there are a whole number, a whole host of constants that have existed since the beginning of, of the universe. That they're, that they're realizing that, that they're so finely tuned, that they are so specific, and this is going into cosmology, but you know, I guess we're, we'll cover this in the, in the next, uh, in the next uh, um, conference, God willing, but uh, important to, to touch upon it, that they're finding out that these constants are so finely tuned that, that they're growingly in, uncomfortable with, what, with how specific these, this, these values are. The cosmological constant, um, the atomic weak force, they're finding that these things are, are, are 10 to the negative 140th power. I mean, it's, it's something so, so finely uh, like tuned that they're finding out, well, maybe perhaps that, maybe perhaps that, well, it isn't necessary for these for this information or for these values to be so finely tuned but let's let's uh, let, let's so they did experiments and they found out that if they just move the you know just move the value just uh, by one part in in this extremely small small number uh, power they find out that things go wildly awry that they find out that with, with the cosmological constant which is probably one of the mo one of the most extreme versions of this is that they find out that from the early Earth atmosphere, they calculated ma mathematical models. They found that with just moving just one, one, one part in 10 to the minus 140, they find out that either A, the universe expands out into infinity, or B, the, the Earth when going, the other, going the other direction, they find out the whole universe collapses into singularity. Either way, you don't have the, the resources, you don't have the, the, the scenario where life exists. So I mean, it's, it's kind of similar to like, uh, what, what they were presuming is that if it's like a, a ball in a in a bowl. You know, they assume that if you distort the the orbit of the ball, eventually it would come to a, a stable region at the, at the at the base of the of the bowl, and that would be where we are right now, as, as some stable form in which we can we can uh, live and, and that allow possible the possibility of life and galaxies and 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 uh, planets. But what they found out is that. It's not like that at all. It, it would be more likened to, you know, a pen sitting on a razor's tip. That either, no matter what, it's, it's just balancing by itself right there. And that if it moves either way with the wind or whatever, the whole thing falls apart and there's nothing there. So, it, if you listen to the, these, the, the modern atheists like Richard Dawkins and, and Sam Harris and, and these other guys, you'll find out that, that, they're, that this, even then they're, they're growingly uncomfortable with this, with these, with these, uh, with these numbers and this fact. Um, and this is something called the anthropic principle. It's, uh, it's basically, um, we try and reason our way out of it by creating multiple galaxies, the multiverse, and all sorts of things. But it, it, these are just even so far beyond the reach that we're now, like, like I, I've said this before, I heard this from Andrew Clavin, I don't know if you know him, but um, that basically it's not, in the past they've accused people that believe in God that whenever we can't find an explanation for things that we say that, this, that, that God did it. And so they say that this is the, the, the God of the gaps. But right now, it seems that things are reversing itself, that it's being flipped on its head. That now, they can't explain why things are so, so precise. That they're saying now that this is, a, you know, this is basically science of the gaps. They're creating universes without even having any evidence of, 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 of such. So. Yeah, I guess you answer my other question that I was going to ask. But like, w rebuttaling or what do the leading atheists say in response to these numbers? Yeah. Is it all just like, okay, there's multiverse and that's well, it? Well, yeah. I mean, like, like they say, it, it's it's called the anthropic principle that the fact that we're able to stand here and ask these questions means, of course, that these that all the constants. Are, are, are tuned for our existence. Of course, that's the, that's the case. But it, it, it's the, there's this philosopher, his name's Leslie Jones. He likened it to a situation where 
you have a firing squad, right? And you're, you're standing before a firing squad and that, uh, you know, these are all trained snipers and they're all aiming at you. And then the guns go off, the, uh, the smoke clears, and then you're, you're, you're there standing and you're saying, oh my gosh, I'm still alive. And then saying, well, of course I'm still alive, I'm here. It's just as unsatisfying as, as that. Thank you. <laughs> So one of the arguments you had on the slides was that all creation was created by a creator, but I don't know, I, I feel like someone could argue then like who created God almost, you know, like if, you know, the watchmaker made the watch, who made the watchmaker and so on and so forth. So how would you answer that question? God is infinite. There, that, that, that is the ultimate end. There is no, I mean, God just exists. It, it only makes sense that there is nothing behind it. I mean, it, it, that, that, that undermines the whole concept of God. That but then couldn't you just say, infinite, like, that the creation exists? Like, everything just exists? Like, uh, uh, that may have been, a, I'm not sure if, uh, what, what you're referring to exactly, but it I may mean, have. if you don't have an explanation for something being created, couldn't you just say that it just exists? Kind of like saying, like, God, we don't have an explanation for how God was, like, so-called created. We just say he exists, right? But, like, if you, like, if a scientist came to you saying, I don't know who created DNA, couldn't you just say also that it just exists? Like, do you see, like... So are you talking more about, like... Like, how would you explain... Why, why is there an explanation for, why, why is there a need for a development of, of life? Why do we have these sciences that develop this, the, the uh, um evolution of, of these things? Is that what you kind of said? Uh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This will, this will be good. Thank you. We'll, we'll have to wrap up for lunch, but I'll answer this question. It's by definition. So there are certain questions that it's wrong to ask them because the question is not right in itself. Can, I, can God create the first um, married bachelor? God can do everything, so, but married bachelor doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So our definition of God is the one who started the whole thing by definition. This is our definition of God. So the question itself is not right. Who created God? Well, if we have a smaller God and a bigger one, our definition is the whole source that transcends everything. This is why we're defining him as, as God. So there is questions that ask are just tricky because they, are, they, don't, they don't make any sense. Any, can, I, can I create any, anything that's contradicting me? Say, can God create and something contradictory? Uh, the first is circular triangle. Uh, no, he can't. Or oh, then he's not God. No, because there is nothing called circular triangle. It's either a circle or a triangle. So when you say, who created God? The question itself defies how we're defining God. We're defining it. He's the one transcending everything. So the question itself is wrong. You don't... We don't have the bear of answer. Or the burden, the burden of answering, is not lying on us because the question itself is as wrong as can God create a circular triangle? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay.